So, hey, Federico Marquez. Marquez? Marquez. Marquez. Federico Marquez from Moonflower Farms. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Oh, anytime, Warren. Appreciate it. So, the first thing I got to ask you, um, why hydroponics? Why Moonflower Farms? Tell me about the story. Tell me about the journey of your business. I would love to hear about it. Oh, it's it's quite a long tale, but I, I'll make it brief. Um, very briefly, um, many years ago when I was still in university, I, I, I interned at Bayer. Uh, uh, they had a Bayer chemical plant and I was interning there working in the laboratory doing analytical stuff. And I came across an interesting article about NASA and NASA astronauts and some work that they were doing in Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. And um, I decided just to drive to Stennis and see what was going on. Because <laughs> when you're young and you got a little cash, you figured, what the heck? Anyway, while I was there, I went to um, uh, the Stennis Space Center. And in 1992, um, they had a uh, NASA bio home. It was a lunar module designed to house four astronauts on the moon. Wow. So when I went to Stennis, I said, wow, this is really cool. And I got to meet some of the researchers. And they said, you're in luck, kid. We're out of a job. No more space exploration. The U.S. is no longer interested in doing anything in space. We're going to be out of a job in six months. What do you want to know? And I was like, I want to know everything. <laughs> <laughs> so the next thing you know, I'm making a really good uh, uh, a meeting with them. And I they actually let me go behind closed doors to walk the NASA biohome. This biohome was designed to keep four astronauts alive on the moon. And it, it was using hydroponics to clean air, clean water, and grow food in space. Wow. So I got to see the design. And they gave me a mountain of information to read. and that they were shocked because I actually read it all and I had a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so the next month I came back and I got to actually see hands on what they were doing with cleaning air, cleaning water and all that. And that was my introduction to hydroponics. I said, wow, what a powerful tool. You know, you got to obviously it was a very expensive back then. You didn't have, you know, Internet. You didn't have um, uh, very good sensors and LED lights were still a thing in someone's imagination. Wow. So, but it was, uh, it was the, I saw the promise and the potential of hydroponics. So long story short, I kept doing that very, four years later, I was working at Bayer. I was now uh, uh, running a laboratory and I, I got to hire some of those same NASA astronauts, uh, not astronauts, they were NASA researchers. Uh, sure. um, those NASA researchers were consultants for me. And I built my first hydroponic greenhouse in a chemical plant. Wow. I talked the higher ups to let me do it in order to treat industrial wastewater using hydroponics. And everybody was shocked because it actually worked. Wow. <laughs> so that was my first greenhouse. I was 26 years old and um, I had NASA scientists, uh, one retired and one that was still working um, at another facility. And that launched my career at Bayer. I had a wonderful career at Bayer. I was there for 19 years. Um, I was their head of NAFTA head of quality and innovation and moved back to Houston in 2007. I was still doing hydroponics. I've done a lot of research on plants. Uh, when you hear people say, oh, you know, plants help clean the air. And, you know, plants can clean the air. All of that research came from Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. And uh, Dr. Bill Wolverton and his team were the main ones doing that. I did a lot of that research as well. So that was my first focus was on plants and how they clean the air, how to get them to clean the air faster and all that. So that was, you know, it was a lot of work, but at the same time at Bayer, I was, I treated industrial waste sweater. I developed new sensors. I came up with all kinds of weird, strange innovations, which, you know, I had a good career. Um, but in 2006, my wife was diagnosed with celiac disease Oh, yeah. expert. She's Norwegian. And um, we moved back to Houston in 2007. I decided I have a lot of patents and I, they're just collecting dust. Maybe it's time to be an entrepreneur. So uh, I left Bayer, started my own company. Um, and it was perfect timing, too, because uh, 
the recession hit in 2008. So by 2010, we were out of money. <laughs> I was like, yay, I have no money. I have no income. And, you know, the recession, there's no one interested in investing in anything. But the irony was I wrote a business plan during that time for okay. a, a, a restaurant concept that would focus on uh, folks that have uh, well, number one, it would be a certified green restaurant, the, the greenest restaurant ever, because I saw what was happening with green restaurants and Green Restaurant Association, okay. uh, very sustainable design. But I was really looking at mostly food allergies because mm -hmm. back then you could only my wife had that. And, you know, it was it cost an arm and a leg. You, you got to live at Whole Foods and there was very limited options. Right, because everything has weed in it, right? Like, Correct. I think literally everything. Yeah. So yeah. when we moved to Houston and I'm doing all this, I'm like, okay, let me go find an organic restaurant. There are no organic restaurants in Houston in 2007. I said, all right, well, let me go find a vegan restaurant. There are no vegan restaurants in Houston. Let me go find a certified green restaurant. There are no certified green restaurants. Let me find a restaurant that has anything gluten-free. There were none. In fact, I did a I did an internet search. I found three restaurants in the United States that had gluten free menu or options. Three. Wow. That was so I went to all three of them. Two of them were terrible. Okay. <laughs> One of them in New York was pretty good, and I noticed they had a line around the store. <laughs> uh huh. I said, okay, that's interesting. They're pretty good. So um, anyway, that's how I formed the 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 concept for uh, Ruggles Green. Um, and that's a, it was a very popular brand in Houston. We licensed the name Ruggles, but it was the first certified green restaurant in Houston. It was wow. the highest certified green restaurant in Texas. And for a brief period of time, it was the highest certified green restaurant in the United States. Um, but we built five of them and that's how I got into the restaurant business. I had no intention of being a restaurateur. I was going to consult. Oh, interesting. Okay. But, but we were rejected 26 times. Wow. And I had given up. It'd been a year. I'm like, this is going nowhere. I'm done. And one day I got a call out of the blue and some young man who inherited a lot of money was interested in it. And I explained, it was the world's worst pitch. It took about one minute. I was, I didn't even want to do it anymore. <laughs> I was You're super other non passionate thing. about it at this point. Yeah, I was like, yeah, it's, it, I, I've I've been rejected so many times. It's like, I'm not, I'm I'll show up and I'll do the thing, but I'm not I'm not holding my breath. But uh, anyway, he read the business plan. He had a lot of questions, and the next day he called me and he says, "Look, I will give you the check because you cannot consult. You know mm. about this certified green stuff. You know about the." this gluten-free and uh, dietary stuff, you know, was, you, you got to be the one running it because none of these other partners you have know anything about this business plan. You're the only one. Yeah. And I was like, oh my, uh, you know, I, I was going to consult you. No, you, if you want this check for a million bucks, you better, you're going to be the one running it, you know? And, and anyway, so we had a restructure and we had a board and we licensed the name Ruggles and then we got it going and, Sure enough, the first store was a huge success. Yeah, so uh, so so I have tons of questions here, but it, it's yeah. it's what an interesting um, career. And that's before Moonflower Farms. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, so Moonflower like, Farms it, evolved from that. So yes, so you had this. So you had this great gig. You say, hey, at some point, I think I want to be an entrepreneur. So there was some motivation there. Which was crazy if you think about it, because, you know, that's a lot of uncertainty. It's a rocky, that's a very uh, a storm filled uh, journey. So do you have any. So like when you started, when you started the first the first thing and you're like, OK, I'm going to go on this entrepreneur journey. I have these patents. Um, what uh, what did you learn or what would you have done differently? Um. You know, there's a part of me that feels like, OK, I could have held on to my day job uh -huh. and uh, done the entrepreneurial thing as well. But it's almost impossible to do that. Because when you're starting on an entrepreneurial journey, it consumes you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's your you're thinking about it nonstop. You're solving problems nonstop. You're innovating nonstop. You're dealing with 
personnel issues or financial issues nonstop. Yeah. So you have to have your entire, you're like on the, on the razor's edge, just sort of balancing and trying to cross on a very thin, very thin uh, 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 over chasm. So yeah. you have to give it your full attention. Yeah. If it's partial attention, you're not going to move very quickly and you're going to lose focus and, and there'll be issues. Sorry about that. My uh, oh. team is calling me. But um, so for me, you know, there was a, a certain amount of r regret that, I mean, I kept getting promoted at Bayer. <laughs> so that was the yeah. problem. Every time I got ready to become an entrepreneur, I'd get promoted and I then business would be okay. And then I'd get promoted again. And I'm I even start thinking about doing something different and I got promoted again. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I had a very, very, very good career at Bayer for a non PhD. Um, but yeah, if I had to do it over again, I would definitely learn more about build up my financial acumen, read, read a lot more books on finance <clears throat> and definitely vet the people you're going to be working with. So okay, if you have interested that. groups, you know, when you're not doing well, no one's interested, but still you might meet other people that are, uh, that seem to be in, it's always good to vet anybody you're going to be in partnership or doing business with. I learned that lesson the hard way with the Ruggles Green experience. So wow. you have to vet very carefully to know who you're uh, in business with. And then if you have a good idea, you have to have faith that you can do it, um, regardless of who's waving a lot of money in front of you. Or, you know, who might be a good partner, but when you vet them, they don't work, they don't look good. You know, yeah. So is that so so here's a real simple example. Shark Tank. You ever watch Shark Tank? Yes. Okay. So so if you had to pick one of the sharks to work with, or would you would you work with all of them or would you or are there some you wouldn't work with? And tell me why. Um well, first of all, I don't watch Shark Tank that much. I think I've only seen two or three episodes. But a okay. good friend of mine uh, did go on Shark Tank and he did quite well. Um, I like Mark Cuban. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I like his, uh, you know, no, no bullshit, straight to the facts. But at the same time, there's a part of him that says, okay, you know, the numbers don't look great, everything, but I like, there's something there. So he's willing to explore the something there part. And sometimes with innovation, you know, it may not look the best, but there's something there that has a, a like a seed of promise of potential hmm. and, um, hmm. and some some groups are good at picking it up we were fortunate with ruggles green we met a young a young man who in had like i said he inherited a lot of money he even said i wanted to start a barbecue place <laughs> that is so so the opposite of what we were we were like yeah. gluten-free restaurant that was all health and wellness and green and sustainability and so uh, it was just the opposite of what he was originally looking for. But he liked the vision. He said that he felt there was something there. Um, and I think Mark Cuban would be one of those that would be like that. Some of the other ones are strictly numbers guys. Yep. And I'm not a big fan of numbers guys. You need, I mean, you need a good numbers guy in your team. You need a good financial. And so you can see what options are available. Yeah. But so at you the same talk time, about you have to have innovation. Yeah. yeah. So I love the innovation. And obviously you're an innovator. That's why you drove to Mississippi and read piles and piles and piles of papers to, to learn. And that's why you innovated at Bayer, which is really cool. So, so what, what about financial? What, what's the most important uh, financial acumen for a person starting a business to have? Well, like I mean, yeah, I mean, for some entrepreneurs, I know it's like, okay, how much is coming in and how much is going out? Okay. We're doing okay. And it's pretty basic. I've had partners like that. All right. I just want to know how much is coming in, how much is going out, and we got to make some changes or do whatever. Okay, that's fine. That's a very, that's one way to look at it. Okay. But another way to look at it, I mean, there's other indicators out there that you can look at. I mean, and part of it is your debt load and part of it is has, uh, your sales and how are you, are you trending up? Are you trending down? Mm -hmm. How many offerings do you have? Sometimes there's different calculations for your value it's like should we actually buy this property or lease the property uh -huh. you know you have to look at it from both short-term and long-term perspective and at the same time if you're um you're like a, a, another a, a mistake that we made was 
we probably shouldn't have sold Bruggles Creek. <laughs> ah. we, sold it, we sold it to private equity, okay. you know, and at the time, and, you know, and once again, this is just my opinion. I don't like private equity. Yeah. They, the, my experience with private equity is they're just blatant liars. They'll say one thing and no worry. We love you. Everything's great. We won't change a thing. As soon as you sign, everything changes. Ah. You know, we won't change a thing. Your numbers are so good and lovely that we won't change a thing. As soon as you sign, boom, everybody's fired. Everything's laid off. All relationships are destroyed. Wow. Sales drop to half. Costs drop down too, but man, sales yeah. are king. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Sales a lot are of sales king. will cover a lot. A lot of sales will cover a lot of other problems. You got that right. And we had some sales, and all of a sudden sales drop. I'm like, oh my God, what are they doing? But lesson learned, you know, you vet the people you work with, you double check. And then um, if the other thing too is if you're selling a business, don't don't get smooth talk don't rely on your gut you got to have various opinions you may even want to get an investment banker or two to look at it you know without charging you of course yeah just to see if they are in the mix and give you different options so it's good to have different options and it's good to have some really good um uh someone who can do a different sort of financial analysis yeah. on no, that's great. That's really good wisdom because I see people all the time and they, they don't really re sometimes even realize the value of their business. The value of a database alone is worth a lot. We had 100,000 people in our database. That's valuable. Yes. You know, and we and and we were doing some very cutting edge stuff that was getting attention all over the U.S. and the globe. Wow. You know, that's valuable. We had a brand recognition that was strong. Yeah, that's super valuable. And we were really positioned to my, my plan originally was to incorporate the hydroponics farming as part of our growth strategy, because I knew the supply chain interruptions and the quality mm -hmm. issues and the food waste issues and all that. With, so that was a big issue. It, when we had the restaurant, I was actually growing crops here and there and trying oh, I cat tomatoes and herbs and some greens and whatever. And, and when I started looking around and doing some research, I'm like, wow, this industry is really positioned to take off. It's like a, it's a nascent industry. It reminded me a lot of the, about the computer industry of the early eighties. Uh -huh. in, in 1980, if you went to a high school and you asked someone, a principal, how many personal computers do you have? And they go, what's a personal computer? Not even a thing. Yeah. Never heard of it. Yeah. But by 1985, you say, hey, how many person? Oh, my God, we got hundreds of them. We need thousands more. Every student should have a personal computer. That happened in the span of five to six years. So yeah. to me, in, in 2015, when we still were looking at selling or growing or what our next move was, um, it was I was very much thinking we needed a rebrand and also get um, hydroponic farming in the mix because it would take care of a lot of the issues we had internally. And it made a lot of sense. So, but when I peered around at the industry, I said, okay, there's some potential and promise here, but there's 90% baloney. I had done it. Remember, I've been doing this for hydroponics for quite a while. Yeah. And I was like, this system is garbage and this is way too expensive. And there's, oh my God, your, your operating costs on that would be terrible. Uh-huh. But these companies were were uh, going and getting uh, venture capital money, and they were they were getting seeded for millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. I was shocked. So by 2017, it was like a, I don't know, maybe it was a FOMO, fear of missing out, by a lot of investors, and they were looking at all these, the new you know tech company, and I knew that most of them had terrible technology. Uh -huh. Their 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 model was just not right. So. Anyway, that's that's where we were. And then it, it was a very I had to make a strategic decision at the time. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, but lesson learned, you, you got to be very careful if you're doing business. It's only 30 bucks to do a background search on some folks you're working on. <laughs> <laughs> and well, if they have a rap sheet, probably not good to get in business with them. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, very sage wisdom, sage wisdom. Sometimes the little things so easy to do. <laughs> sometimes the little things are the things that we miss that are the most important things. Oh yeah, I mean, if you, and by the way, nobody wants to be near you when you're you're struggling and you have nothing. But boy, as soon as you start making money. All those uh, rejections start coming right back at you. It's like, oh, we were wrong. We're we're here. We're it's, so, w which is okay. But you still gotta vet them and make sure. And 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 obviously, it's relationships. How well did they treat you when you were, you know, struggling and, and yes. looking for something? And what kind of did that was the door left open? Was you know, were they just very dismissive? Uh, you know, and then you gotta vet them. Well, that says a lot about. It. That says a lot about character. You can tell a lot more about character when when uh, uh, when people treat you when you're down versus when you're on top. Everybody's your friend when you're on top. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about the vision for your business and where where's where are you going to take it next? Yeah, yeah. So uh, one of the and then like I said, very ironic. Um, I, I mentioned to you earlier, like my my wife was the one that came up with the name Ruggles Green when we were forming. I had a list of terrible names, really bad names. And she just looked at it and said, just call it Ruggles Green. And that was it. Put it on business plan, get it going. Same thing happened in 2015. I was very much interested in doing something in hydroponics. And I was just trying to see what was out there, best available technologies, uh, what's the best model, what crops to grow, what, you know, where was the, the, the sweet spot, what kind of potential there was. Mm -hmm. And um, I had another list of bad names and I, ironically, during that time, I got a call from a, a colleague of mine at NASA, and uh, during the Ob Obama administration, they they had gotten funding, and they said, "Hey, space program is back." You yeah. Know, before, remember, it was killed in the early '90s. Yes. So they're, forget it's too expensive. It went, not not going to the moon, not going to Mars. We'll keep up a space station, but that's about it. We're not doing anything else. 2015, it's like, oh. oh Maybe we are going to go to the moon. Maybe mm -hmm. we do need to set up a lunar uh, base. You know, obviously uh, by then SpaceX uh, had been making some real progress and costs were essentially going down and there were various options. Yes. So, but they, they got a renewed budget and they called me, they were excited and they said, hey, we heard you're doing hydroponics or you're looking into doing hydroponics. And I said, yeah, yeah I'm looking at this or this. And um, they said, well, maybe you can help us put flowers on the moon. And I said, oh, that's cool. And my wife was like, call it Moonflower. <laughs> <laughs> that is so great. That's a really scientific way to name a business. I know. So, I mean, I had a, li a list of names that were terrible. Like, okay, Moonflower. So the business plan that day was changed to Moonflower Hydroponics. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, the, the goal at the time when we first began um, was to look at the technology, really look at the technology to see what could scale. Okay. And um, there's a lot of, you know, the Netherlands has really great hydroponic technology and they have acres, hundreds of acres of greenhouses everywhere. They're, they're a breadbasket to Europe. Mm. Uh, they were a country that was essentially starving to death after World War II. They regrouped, they focused on technology, they do, they became self-sufficient and then became a net exporter. So yeah. they have great hydroponic technology, but very expensive. Uh -huh. Um there was a big push in the um, in the late uh, 2016, 2017 for indoor vertical farming. And so we, in 2016, we went ahead and we established the first indoor vertical farm in Texas, here oh. in Houston. Okay. So January, 2016, we opened up Moonflower Farms, our first in a 1400 square foot shack with 10 foot tall flood and drain tables with LED lights everywhere and equipment and sensors and um, we were growing microgreens, uh, specialty herbs, and some edible flowers in there, mostly mm -hmm. microgreens and specialty herbs. But really, the goal was to vet the technology and see what was practical, what is this scalable. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was small, it was 1,400 square foot. I mean, I'm not raising millions, I was just trying to get this thing going. And we yeah. learned a lot. Um, and of course, we were still talking to our NASA colleagues, we had a lot of interest. But the, uh, that experience taught me is enough talking to them. At the end of the day, you're growing food crops. You're not growing marijuana, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, you're not, it's $2,000 a pound versus $2 a pound. Big change. So you cannot use 
marijuana growing equipment and sensors and technology to, to provide a two dollar a pound product and mm -hmm. i knew that going in so that's why we were very careful of our costing but i think that a lot of these other tech companies did not and that's why they were oh my god i have to sell a million lettuces a month in order to recoup this i only have orders for a hundred thousand well you're nine hundred thousand short <laughs> You know, so that that was a but I knew that going on. And so yeah. we were just learning. And then um, after several years, it was like, OK, we have to build a greenhouse. Our electricity should be as little as possible. Sure. We, we, we learned that the three biggest costs were uh, labor, energy uh, or electricity, energy and water and chemicals. So we had to focus on cutting these down to as little as possible, our operating expenses to as little as possible. Yeah. And then working on your capital costs, so do it smarter so the next time you do it, you don't, the first one is always the most expensive. Yeah. It costs three to four times more than you think it will. But if you've learned your lesson and, and if you've actually survived that, which most people don't, you know the next one's gonna be half as much or even a third as much. Yes. And then you learn from that. But meanwhile, if your operating expenses are, have you figured out how to get them as little or as low as possible? And you've got this, now you might have a scalable solution. Uh -huh. um, because one of the trends that we're seeing now, and, and by the way, I knew there was potential because of the climate change and all that. But after learning all that, we said, okay, we're going to build this greenhouse. We built a 20,000 square foot greenhouse and five acres. And, um, and, even, and during Harvey, it slowed everything down by a year. You could not find a worker to lift a hammer. It was impossible. So, um, but by 2020, uh, by it's funny, our grand opening was on March 2020. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so every contract we had was canceled in April 2020. Yeah, what you have, you have perfect timing. You so I was like. Perfect timing. I started Ruggles Green during the worst recession we've ever had. And for a year, I'm like, okay, we're going to lose our butts. It's like, it's over. And then all of a sudden, it's, it just takes off. <laughs> and now we, we get this thing ready for a grand opening. And COVID, never part of our business plan. No. And no one's buying anything. Every restaurant is shutting down. Every distributor we talked to is like, nope. Every single contract we have that looks good is turned off oh, and we're like, oh my God, what are we going to do? Yeah. But on a good note, we survived. I don't know how, but we survived. A lot of it was savings and stuff that I had. The, the, the monies that I had from the sale of Ruggles Green, I never intended to put all of it in the Moonflower. Guess what? I put every penny in Moonflower. Uh -huh. It had to keep the doors open. But Long term, uh, right now, what we're hearing, we're having good meetings with the USDA. The U.S. right now, 58% of the population lives in cities. In yeah. 2030, 62% of the population will live in cities. In 2050, it'll be 70% plus that live in cities. Guess where the food is? Yeah, It's country. not in cities. Yeah, <laughs> The yeah. food is currently 1,700 miles away from farm to table. Every wow. year, it gets a little bit further away. Most of the food for the United States, uh, produce, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables, comes from south of the border. Mexico, Sal El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, and it's getting further and further away. Water is becoming shorter and shorter supply. Sure. So all these trends tell me hydroponics is the future. It mm -hmm. solves all those problems. So, uh, for example, our facility in Houston, 20,000 square feet, we could easily produce 10,000 heads of lettuce a week without, without any issue. Right now, we're producing four, but we could do 10,000 if we needed to. And our cost, we've gotten our cost down to like almost very less than the 1,400 square foot building. So we've learned how to get our cost structure down to very, very economical, highly competitive. Um, and we also learned that we have to build our own structures and develop our own technology, which we're doing. Because like the computer industry of the past, you just can't piece a bunch of things together and expect it to work well. Yes. We do our own systems and our own hardware and our own software. So that's what we're doing. We have our own software development. We have our own hardware development. 
and we're designing our own greenhouses. That way we know our cost structure. We know we can roll it out in 90 days and we know what the, uh, the operating expenses will be. But more importantly, we're gonna have two high school students running that facility. What? Two high school students. Right now we are training high school students to run these uh, hydroponic farms. So we got a, a grant with the city of Houston and we're rolling, uh, we're doing hydroponic training right now at several schools. Uh, we have the first moon lab. Uh, it's moon lab to every high school that we deploy is called moon lab two, moon lab three, moon lab four. Nice. So oh. Moon lab two is in Shadow Creek High School in um, Alvin ISD. Moon lab three is in Carver High School in Aldean ISD. We're talking at Houston Independent Store District about another one. I, I have, have high school interns that are super bright. I have college interns that are super bright, but the high schoolers I'm so impressed with. And, I, and once again, going back to the computer industry. Yes. The computer industry was, in, in my opinion, you know, and what, what do I know? My, in my opinion, the computer industry and the software industry was built by high schoolers. It was the high school kids that were hacking away Day and night, the, the Bill yeah. Gates, you know, the Elons, the Zuckerberg, the, the high school kids that are just doing all that stuff, then later on say, okay, look, I came up with something clever, and boom, the, the industry just explodes. That's why we're training the high school kids. Remember, labor, electricity, and water and chemicals. I can squeeze electricity and water and chemicals very low, yes. but the labor... I don't need 20 PhDs and engineers and all that. Yes. Two high schools. So we're rolling out in Houston, the first hyper local grow network. And we're talking to USDA. They gave us a letter of support. We're trying to get that going in Houston. And if we can get it to go in in Houston, these high schoolers, we can train and then they can operate these a small, essentially small, highly productive greenhouses. And with that, our vision is that eventually we don't have to go 1,700, 2,000 miles away to get this. Oh, we are now becoming more self-sufficient. Yeah. The city can now produce 100% of its own lettuce. I think by 2035, by 2030, every major city in the U.S. will have hydroponics in or around the city. By 2035, Amazing. they're going to become, you're going to have... Um, I would like to see at least one city become as, as self-sufficient as possible where they eliminate that 2000 mile round trip. Yeah. So then you have, you have better food, fresher food, cheaper food because of transportation costs or correct equitable with the other things. It will be cheaper or comparable. Correct. Or comparable. So you, less trucks on the road, um, less emissions. There's a whole bunch of other things that, that are, and then, okay. So here's the cool thing. So you, you're not only you're, you have an education program, you have, you have a, a tech program. You have a, uh, I assume you're going to sell this, your models of this gear to other, other folks. We are developing the platform that people can then go with. And I, we're using the Apple strategy. Remember, Apple was very, very, they, they were laughed at at the beginning because they went very hard into the education industry, not the corporate, not the, and they said, look, we have to develop the future programmers, the future developers, the future employees, and the future customers with, with this new digital ecosystem that we're producing. Well, we're doing the same thing. We're developing a platform that we feel that the, it'll be the new a growing ecosystem that will uh, that high schoolers can really adopt and say, "Oh, I like this. I can do a lot of cool things with this." Yeah. And their innovation is way beyond what I can even imagine right now. That's so that's amazing. what I envision for the future. That's amazing. Look, this is this has been an incredible interview, and I've learned so much, <laughs> and I just love your vision, and I I also love the randomness of your naming. Uh, the um, I didn't if it's randomness or providence, but then your horrible timing, and yet your perseverance oh, yes. to get through <laughs> your perseverance to get through all that bad timing and still make successful businesses. That's awesome. Yeah, so I mean, I I definitely invite you to the farm to uh, let you know, uh, show you what we're doing. Um, like I said, I'm we're meeting with the NASA folks today. We're still talking to NASA. Love Our it. goal is that my my personal goal is by 2030 
we do have a growing system on the moon and guess what it's growing flowers flowers i was gonna say it's <laughs> edible flowers I, I i guarantee it'll be edible in fact i'm pretty sure it'll be nasturtium flower okay it's it's got it's high in nutrients you can eat the leaves you can eat the stem the entire plant is edible and the flowers are edible too and it's, it looks pretty. It's going to look it great. It looks pretty. It grows quickly. It's healthy. Um, very popular in Asian cuisines. And it has a spiciness to it that astronauts need to keep their uh, uh, olfactory um, uh, senses working. So there, okay, there's a lot of aspects to it. Last question. Are you planning on flying up there and setting this thing up for them? <laughs> I would love to at some point, but... It might be one of the high schoolers that I have who has his grad degree and is now up there doing it. You know, you never know. That's but, amazing. Uh, it's an amazing. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Federico. Sure. Moonflower Farms, innovators, educators, and uh, and and purveyors of great food. That's right. That's that's the goal. <laughs> All right. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Warren.